Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Michael Schaefer. And I'm Fiona Bennett. Well, it's extremely exciting to be here and chatting and getting ready for another episode, Michael. Absolutely, Fee. This is the second one in this kind of mini-series of the Poetry Exchange Revisited, we could call it. Uh, And uh, it's been really great to listen back, actually. The conversation that we're going to feature this month was quite a long time ago now, wasn't it? Must be six or seven years ago, is that right? Yes, I'm sure it is, at least that. We were at the John Rylands Library in Manchester. Very, very beautiful library. If you've not been and you're anywhere near Manchester, go and poke your nose in there. It's really something else. And at the time, our guest was working at the library, um, Harry, and he brought along a Frank O'Hara poem. And I think, Michael, that was the beginning, possibly, of a long and exciting uh, discovery for you with Frank O'Hara. And in fact, I slightly associate you with Frank O'Hara. Yeah, I really like Frank O'Hara. I really connect with him on some level. There is something in in that tone, and very much as we discuss in the in the episode that you'll be hearing, there's something about that thing of of a poem being able to be funny, and and that kind of gave me permission in some way to have that relationship with poetry and with with specific poems. We were talking earlier, Fee. I was supposed to be going to New York today. Uh, And for various reasons, that's had to change. But fingers crossed, I'll be there in the not too distant future. Uh, And Frank O'Hara is very New York and I can kind of wander the streets of New York and I can have Frank O'Hara poems going round in my head. Exactly. Meanwhile, something a little bit spooky happened, actually, Michael. I was thinking before we were about to meet and talk about Frank O'Hara, I thought, "What, what is it about Frank O'Hara that's so... And I was thinking about this very particular power of description that he has. There's lots of things you can say about Frank O'Hara, but it's this this descriptive force and the way that the descriptions, you experience them physically, you know, which which I'm sure is part of what kind of excites you as a performer about them. But um, I was thinking, ah, oh, yeah, what is it about that Frank O'Hara? And I thought, ah, oh, I'll go and get that book down from the shelf by the brilliant Mark Doty, another New York poet, which is called The Art of Description. Anyway, the book literally fell open on the one page in the book that I can remember offhand where he specifically references Frank O'Hara. Oh, I love it when that happens. It just felt so extraordinary. And um, he talks about a poem that's called You Are Gorgeous and I'm Coming, in which the opening lines are, Vaguely I hear the purple roar of the tore down Third Avenue L. It sways slightly but firmly like a hand or a golden-downed sigh. I mean, it's just, wow. what, what a description of a tube train, right? And uh, Mark Doty says, this is the opening movement of a poem, movement, he calls it a movement, I like that. This is the opening movement of a poem titled You Are Gorgeous and I'm Coming. And encountering these lines immediately after the title suggests that vague violet roar is an approximation of the sound of approaching orgasm. If you could hear the onrush of that bodily event, unstoppable as an approaching train. And I think this is the thing about O'Hara is that he is, you know, he's not standing and looking out at something outside of himself. It is happening in and through him. And he kind of overlays these experiences one on top of the other. Um, And that happens in a a different way in in the poem we're going to hear. So thanks, Fee. I think that takes us nicely into the conversation. You're going to be hearing myself and Jackie Kington talking about Lana Turner Has Collapsed, the poem that's been a friend to Harry. Is it a great place to work here? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really lovely. I think um, the collection's what's incredible. I know the building... I mean, this whole it's amazing. room is lovely, but when yes. you start looking at the collection, yeah. it's, mm. we've got, um, I mean, it ranges from like 3,000 year old tablets up to, um, we've got unpublished William Burroughs cut ups oh. and things in our collection and that kind of stuff. It's just great, yeah. So yeah. I'm intrigued about this idea of the poem as a friend. Oh. It was re- it's a really interesting question yeah. to kind of start with, I yeah. think, you know. Um, 
because I actually, I chose the poem quite quickly, but I then also started thinking about what I thought a friend was yes, quite a lot. And yeah. um, thank you very much. Pleasure. Cheers. Can I ask you to, um, to read it out for us? To just yeah, sort of get it in the room. I also try not to do Frank O'Hara voice because I always tend to try and do a slightly New York kind of thing. But, so. uh, Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along and suddenly it started raining and snowing and you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard. So it was really snowing and raining and I was in such a hurry to meet you but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky. And suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood, there is no rain in California. I've been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you, get up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's great in the way you read it, that yeah. it does just kind of go straight through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, quite quickly. And yeah. Definitely. Um, and I think it's part, I think you can't help but read it quite lightly. Mm. I think that's one of the reasons why I enjoy it so much because I do enjoy it I just I like reading it and it's one of the few poems that I I can't recall it word for word but I know it well enough mm. to just be standing at a bus stop mm. and go through it in my mm. head and because it does go through so lightly mm. and to me it sounds quite fun I know it's Lana Turner has mm. collapsed which mm. sounds quite dreadful mm. but. so how did you find it what was the um so this is actually I don't know if this is cheating slightly in terms of this podcast, but I studied English literature. Right. So I kind of um, came to this poem studying. We didn't study this particular poem, but Frank O'Hara was introduced to me at university. Yeah. And then he was the first poet that I really came across mm. that I just thought, this is great. Yeah. And um, I just kind of loved, fell in love with Frank O'Hara. And then this poem in particular, I think just kind of sums up that real joy of poetry to mm. me. That kind of, when you, and not necessarily that this poem is the ultimate joyful poem, but that finding something that you really love and you can just read over and over and over again. Why do you love it? And it doesn't get why tired. Do you, why do you love it? I think it's partly because it's really quite flippant. There's something about how flippant this final, the final line is, oh, Lana Turner, we love you, get up. Yeah. That seems to be somehow have so much about kind of like the getting on with life and mm. not having to take stuff to as such a huge thing you can kind of acknowledge things and then just carry on with what the day is mm. and kind of having that huge headline up against the fact that you're talking about the weather and the traffic yes. which seem like such banal conversation points but that seems to be more important than this huge headline yes. in this poem Often I find myself reading this poem when things are a bit crap. Yeah. Or like if, if um, I feel like I'm really struggling with something mm. because there's a lightness in the fact that everything seems to be kind of going wrong in this poem. Yes. But the poem itself seems to be so right mm. and seems to like be quite uplifting. But I mean, Lana Turner's collapse is the first line. Yeah. And it's snowing and it's raining and you're having an argument. <laughs> well, not yes. having an argument, but you're disagreeing with someone about whether it's hailing or snowing or raining, and the traffic's rubbish. Yes. And then you see this headline. But actually, the, I think when I read the poem, it all seems so light. I'm just interested, do you remember the first time you read it or heard it in terms of the initial response? Did you have that response of, oh, this is just... Well, it was just that old Lana Turner, we love you, get up line. I remember just smiling yeah. at that, at the kind of... I think I tend to have a thing when I read poems, I read them with a very serious head on and think like, this must be very serious. It's a poem and it's very serious mm. kind of thing. And it'll take me a few times to get sort of levels of irreverence and things like that. But I read it and I, that final line, I just couldn't help but smile. And I think part of it is whenever I come to this poem, I remember that first kind of like, just yes. smiling having, yeah. having read it. And in a way it sounds like your sort of first experience of uh, sort of realising that poetry can be irreverent in, in that mm. way. That I really identify with what you're saying. That I think my default position sometimes can be poems put in front of me and I adopt quite a, a sort of yeah. serious kind of head. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So Definitely. That's yes. where I automatically think mm. it's going to be. Yeah. Especially as a poet writing in the 50s mm. and I, especially older poetry, I definitely put in that thing of thinking it's got to be kind of 
serious. I mean, I go to spoken word nights now and there's loads of stuff that's just great mm. and not necessarily, I mean, obviously there is really quite um, sincere stuff, but you also have loads of irreverent stuff. It just kind of, I think it opens up what poetry could be, yeah. And I kind of thought with this as well, is that the top, before we get to that, we've got the Lana Turner has collapsed in the middle and towards the end. Yeah. So this bit with there's no snow in Hollywood and there's no red, it kind of feels like, so it's kind of like, so there's no excuse. Mm. There's no excuse for anything to be kind of this rain and there's all this, this right. rain and there's all, and that's yeah. all really terrible. And, yeah. But actually, there's no snow in Hollywood and there's no rain, so there's no excuse because everything's potentially yeah. that's a good thing, well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. But, and also, kind of like, how dare you collapse in, kind yeah. of in, in Hollywood? Because I've got all the rain and the snow here. That's right. I should be collapsing. That's right. And all this, yeah. yeah so yeah. get up. That's the way that so I kind up. of yeah. saw it, but heard it. And also the collapsed, I think, I think one of the reasons I like it is there's so much in that collapsed because um, collapse. someone collapsing, yes. I mean, is that, that could be, yes. they could drop down dead, that could be them gone. Yes. But the way that he's kind of reading it is at this kind of like lapse at a party, that kind of like, you know, yes. having too much of a good time. And yes. you, oh, we love you, just get up, <laughs> just, just get up, it's fine. Yes. You know. That's the thing, the headline is Lana Turner has collapsed. Yes. He's in, the eye in the poem is interpreting it that she's been to a party and had too yes. many drinks yeah. and yes. gone down. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, yes. yeah. There's something quite camp about it. Yes. Yeah, super camp, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a sort of a gossipy... Yeah. <laughs> well, you could be on your phone, couldn't you? Going, yeah, it, I was trotting along. Blah, blah, blah. It feels very really modern. <laughs> it feels really modern. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and in the kind of celebrity age yes. that we're in now. Yes. Yeah. And, and so it's kind of like it's presented with, you know, the exclamation mark, with the drama of it. Mm. But it's not, it's not felt. No. It's, it's not kind of internalised yeah. in any no. way. Or... Yeah, and that kind of, you can see these big headlines. I mean, this is obviously entertainment newsy stuff, but like, you could look at a headline today and it's something about the Brexit. And, you know, Boris Johnson says this, so-and-so says mm. that. Mm. And you read it as a headline, you get the news, but actually what is more present is that it's snowing that affects my yes. present much more that it's snowing and it's uh yes. and it's raining so you don't actually really have to necessarily engage with that headline like the big thing that seems to be o overshadowing the whole thing mm. isn't isn't the important thing in this yes. poem it's more about kind of perspective and the okay. trotting along, I just love trotting, <laughs> yeah. the trotting along, so you got Lana Turner collapse and then I was trotting along <laughs> yes. like that's just comical mm. that kind yes. of like Yes. Uh, and maybe that's when the first kind of like notice quite how camp and light this poem is yes. that is trotting yes. yeah. in New York essentially. Yes. Well. Yeah. You know. yeah. And it's that you were trotting along and suddenly. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's it's like a cartoon, it's isn't like it? A drama. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you kind of know this poem. Yeah. So it's not a question that you would get this out and read it, but that. Yeah. So what, what, what would be the circumstances when you might find yourself kind of reciting it to yourself in your head? Sometimes I really consciously think, like, I'd like to think about this poem now because mm. things are just getting mm. a bit much. And you think, right, Lana Turner has collapsed. <laughs> I was trying along. Yeah, yeah. And this, this kind of... Um, yes. And, it, and that, it's almost like a reset button in that yes. situation. Yes, yes. Um, and, and kind of like a reminder that you can just tap into the good mm. things that are happening within you. Yes. And then other times, I think, I, because I do just like the poem, I might just sort of think of it, and then you're smiling on the bus, rather yes. than, do you know what I mean? Yes. Um, oh, it's lovely, so it really is a friend. Well, yeah, well, this is it, because I, um, when I first read the, the question, I think of a poem that's a mm. friend, mm this is the poem that immediately came into my head. Mm. And then I thought, no, but I'll have to think properly about what I choose because I have to think carefully and present <laughs> something that makes sense. But actually, the, yeah. in terms of, because then I started thinking about what is a friend. Mm. And I thought of that person that mm. it doesn't matter what mood you're in, mm. they can come along mm. and say so much without really getting really direct with you or having to sit down and really work out what's going on with you. They just manage to kind of get you mm. and just chat. Mm absolute nonsense with you mm. a bit and but it that's what helps mm. and it can be any situation and any mm. time in any tone mm. and this is the poem that I could read at any point 
and really just get oh, how something lovely, out of it. Isn't it? Mm. Yeah. It's mm. interesting because when you said about that you really know the poem, I think it's like you really know it with oh. your life, mm. you know, yeah. what it's about. You've mm. really internalised it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. what I feel that mm. in terms of being with it. Mm. Well, I think it's a really important poem to me because it's been there, been friends with this poem <laughs> for, for probably about um, five years or so. Mm. So since I first read it, it probably, this does sound a bit like a friendship because I probably was aware of it for about a year before I really... <laughs> Decided to marry it. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Started like really hanging out and then... Um, but it, yeah, it definitely is there. Mm. And you know, you know when you're not thinking, and then there's a thing that comes into your head. Mm. It's often this, this. like on. just having a shower and mm. then just being like, I'm going to turn it collapse. Because it's just fun to read, I think. Mm. I think it's just fun. Do you ever say it out loud to yourself? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because, well, yeah, I mean, that's when I'm in the shower, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Um, and also maybe if um, I'm putting washing out or something like that. Yeah. That's the kind of space it occupies, the really kind of like the mundane, mundane stuff, stuff that's going on, yeah. Yeah. And it, maybe it's a bit funny if you witness it, because you just be put, because <laughs> it starts with a great line, and you just put it hanging up your pants or something, you just go, Lana Turner has collapsed. <laughs> yeah. And then you suddenly, I would, yeah. I don't know Frank O'Hara brilliantly, but somebody else did bring in um, one of his poems, Having a Coke with You. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I loved. And, um, he was talking about this idea of him being a flaneur. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what's a flaneur? What's a flaneur? Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah. Like, it's like someone that, my understanding, you, you, you probably know, it's like someone that kind of is like a people watcher, uh -huh. you know, and just kind of a bit loose and just kind of yeah. drifts about. But like, um, yeah, observing what's going on, the kind of small things. And I don't know, that's the sort of yeah, idea. Yeah. Right and, and, and this um, comes from a book of poems called Lunch Poems which of all poems that he's written on his lunch break, oh. that's the point. So he just kind of, mm. Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who rang City Lights, I think, said like, ah, oh, Frank O'Hara, have you got any poems you want to publish? And he says, oh, no, I don't think I do. All I've been doing is writing these poems in my lunch break. Okay. And he's like, well, we'll do them. And maybe there's yes. how kind of mundane the space this also lives mm. in, that it's the lunch poems. Mm. And it is that flaneur, it's the kind of just wandering around. Mm and observing what's happening mm. as you're experiencing mm. what's... Yeah. But there's, there's the, yeah, there's an immediacy yeah. to, to the way they were written yes. and the way they yes. kind of read. Yeah. Mm. yeah, definitely. It sounds like it's a, um, a, a really important part of your life, poetry, actually, doesn't it? But no, it, I mean, it definitely is. I mean, a lot of it. And also it does serve a really practical thing as well, like this poem has a practical place in my life because I can access it yes. when I when you need feel like to. I need to yeah. but also poetry I think I'm ter I've never kept a diary I wouldn't ever keep a diary because I just can't I don't quite have the discipline to sit down and write yeah. the, yes. what's happened in the day and mm. I have friends that do that mm. and I think it's brilliant mm. but what I can do is scribble down something that I can frame mm. in something poetic yes. and then have that somewhere and then flick mm. to it Lovely. if I want to remember stuff. Mm. That's kind of how I would document mm. that. There's a is it Leonard Cohen biography or autobiography or something, and it's a quote of his, and he just said, I was so scared of performing, and I think the first gig he ever did, he got on stage, strummed the guitar and got up and walked off. I was just like, I don't want to do this. And then he just decided that he'd write songs because he, and mm. this is the quote, I just wanted to document this little life of mine. Mm. And I think that's, mm. it's just the documenting kind of what you're mm. doing and appreciating that mm. it might be a little life in the context of the whole world, but actually to you and possibly to some people that you know mm. and that care about you, it's mm. a, a bigger thing mm. and it makes sense to document mm. that. And oh, it's that's wonderful, isn't great. it? And that's very Frank O'Hara, I think, isn't it? Yeah, maybe. That's well, fantastic. Oh, it's great. Oh, I'm glad you've been so oh, enthusiastic it's about this. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Really lovely. Thank you. Oh, it's great. Right. So you're done. That's it. No, thank you. I really oh, enjoyed that. Yeah. It's nice to have an excuse to talk about that's right. the poem with people. Lovely to, talk. Lovely to meet you. 
Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along and suddenly it started raining and snowing. And you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard. So it was really snowing and raining. And I was in such a hurry to meet you, but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky. And suddenly I see a headline. Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. I have been to lots of parties. And acted perfectly disgraceful. But I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Lana Turner, Turner, we we love love you. you. Get Get up. up. So that was Michael and Jacqueline with the gift reading there of Lana Turner Has Collapsed by Frank O'Hara. Mike, I've got to say, in the listening back and choosing which which episodes to revisit, it it was partly for that gift reading and the pair of you (laughs) going at it, hammer and tongs. I mean, I just loved that. And and it's, it's an unusual... Uh, you know, I think we're rightly cautious about over dramatizing or getting over the top or yeah, yeah, yeah. messing around with them or whatever. But it just really worked because you'd all together had such a great sort of connection through and into the poem. And then it was lucky that Jackie was on that day because I probably couldn't have done that. It takes well, a trained actor. Yeah, lovely to to hear it back. And um, people bring us different types of friends don't they? You know, with this mm. idea of a poem as a friend. And uh, I, re- I really like the way Harry spoke about this poem as a friend. It was slightly different to, to some of the other friends that we get. Mm-hmm. It was brilliant. So I was thinking about, uh, we, we like to offer our extra poem on these revisited yes. episodes. And I was thinking, oh, what what might be an interesting jumping off point? I'm enjoying this kind of linking and moving on idea and um, the poem that came to mind was actually an Edna St Vincent Millay poem which of course is a very different period of time to Frank O'Hara but it's a poem called The Concert so I thought I might just read that Great The Concert No, I will go alone I will come back when it's over Yes Of course I love you. No, it will not be long. Why may you not come with me? You are too much my lover. You would put yourself between me and song. If I go alone, quiet and suavely clothed, my body will die in its chair. And over my head a flame, a mind that is twice my own, will mark with icy mirth the wide advance and retreat of armies without a country, storming a nameless gate, hurling terrible javelins down from the shouting walls of a singing town where no women wait. Armies clean of love and hate, marching lines of pitiless sound, climbing hills to the sun, and hurling golden spears to the ground. Up the lines, a silver runner, bearing a banner, whereon is scored the milk and steel of a bloodless wound, healed at length by the sword. You and I have nothing to do with music. We may not make of music a filigree frame within which you and I tenderly glad we came, sit smiling hand in hand. Come now, be content. I will come back to you. I swear I will. And you will know me still. I shall be only a little taller than when I went. Mmm, Faye, that's fantastic. Thank you. I think that poem is... Definitely a friend of mine. I think I have a sense of why you've picked that one for this moment in relation to to, to the Frank O'Hara that we heard. But do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I think there's just a couple of things, really. One is this fabulous conversational tone and the direct address, which happens in many Frank O'Hara poems, which is just so... It's so enlivening, isn't it? This kind of involvement immediately, isn't there? There's a sense of involvement, which I really, really love. And then, obviously, the poem itself I could say a lot about, but 
it's also that I think there is this overlay of being right inside the experience of something. So she's at this concert and she imagines and experiences this whole world of what comes to her through the listening to the music. And she wants to be in that world with that music and not in the filigree frame of the relationship standing outside of the experience of the music and looking at it together. And I I think I know many friends who enjoy going to cinema or theatre or concerts alone for for just this reason. So there's something O'Hara-ness for me about this kind of immersive experience of the world and the ability to then lay that down in a poem. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So O'Hara was the 1950s, am I right in saying? Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to say she was late 19th century. Well, it's from a collection that was published in 1923. Oh, a little bit later than I thought. Yeah, OK, great. But still a long time before Frank O'Hara. That's quite a thing to, to, to write about the experience of, of hearing live music, isn't it? She's incredibly skillful, isn't she? And of course... We've had another Edna St Vincent Millay poem brought to us by the fantastic playwright Laura Wade talking about ashes of life. If you would like to, uh, to hear Laura talking about ashes of life, that's in our archive. It's, it's number 45. And our thanks to, I think we might have said it at the time, but I think it was Irene or Irene, I'm not sure how her name's pronounced, who suggested that we number the episodes because we hadn't been doing that. So as we use that in, in this time of revisiting, it's doubly helpful, isn't it? So thank you, Irene. Thank you also to people who've been writing in with the poem that's been a friend to them. We've had a couple of astonishing letters, really, from people telling us about the poem that's been a friend to them and we are in this mode of of looking at the material as a whole so it's a really great time to be receiving them so if you're sitting there and thinking oh, there is that one do drop us a line and let us know about it um, we relish hearing from you and we're looking at finding new ways to share all the poems that we've heard about and we'll be giving you some news about that in the not too distant future That's about all the time we've got this month. We'll be back with you next month with more Poems as Friends. Until then, thank you for listening.